Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the president of the Fragrance Foundation, Linda Levy. Good morning, everyone. I am truly delighted, I like to use that word, to welcome all of you to our third annual Creative Panel event. The creatives I want to tell you about. So this event is designed to inform, enlighten, and inspire you. And we have a very inspired panel today. I've been looking forward to this discussion because we have four outstanding creative people. I don't even want to use the word people. Four outstanding women with us today. You're going to be psyched to hear what they have to say. So let me tell you about our fabulous panelists. First of all, we are thrilled that we have Aaron Lauder here today, who is... For those of you who don't know, which I think is impossible, Aaron is the founder and creative director of Aaron and the style and image director for Estee Lauder. Aaron Beauty was founded in 2012 and in just over five years has introduced 20 fragrances and has expanded distribution to over the new count 41 countries globally. This is really a big business, Aaron. And let's not forget and I can't wait to go myself, her fabulous lifestyle boutiques, which are in Southampton and Palm Beach. So Aaron, we're thrilled you're here today. Next up is one of my BFFs in the world, and that's Karen Corey. Karen Corey is currently serving as the Senior Advisor, Creative and Strategic Development Person of, the, of Corporate Fragrance for the Estee Lauder Companies. Now, Karen has recently announced that she's going to retire on November 1st. However, we're going to be connected forever. There is no such thing as retirement in a friendship with a BFF, but Karen, you have a celebrated career. Your fragrance portfolio speaks volumes in our industry. I think everyone got to see the whole... Aaron collection outside today, and although you're retiring, I'm going to keep saying it, we are connected forever. There is no such thing in our vocabulary. And on to another fabulous lady, Honorine Blanc. Um, <laughs> most of you know Honorine. She is a master perfumer at Fermanish. I see my Fermanish friends here today. She describes herself as a perfectionist, but she believes that it's the harnessing, I love this story, the harnessing of imperfection that allows for the creation of new structures in addiction and sensuality. Quite a claim to fame for Honorine. I like this approach when developing fragrances, and I can't wait to hear more about it today on the panel. And last but certainly not least, to moderate our discussion with this very impressive panel today is the equally impressive Jane Larkworthy. And besides being one of the most hysterical people I've ever met in my entire life, and that takes a lot, Jane pens columns for New York Magazine's The Cut and Covetour, and is a contributor to L. Day Core in style, and of course we all know formally the executive beauty director at W Magazine. So, before we welcome them to the stage, I would like to share a little commercial message for the Fragrance Foundation with everyone. We're gonna have a great time today, but we have a lot going on in the very near future. It is the big award season for the fragrance industry. So, just in case you haven't put it on your calendar yet, next Friday, because we've gathered today as a preview, I guess, on April 6th Friday, we officially kick off the award season at the finalist luncheon, where we will announce the top five finalists as winners in editorial, marketing, and social media and including our face of the year, thank you Victoria's Secret for the fantastic, gorgeous Romy Stride. And at the luncheon, attendees will have an opportunity to vote again. Now did everyone hear me on that? I'm gonna repeat it. When you go to the luncheon, you have an opportunity to vote one more time for the fragrance of the year in luxury, prestige, and popular categories. And for each 10 votes, they equal one, extra vote for the fragrance, and, that, and you'll know that. So 
You can win by just one vote sometimes. And for the first time ever, everyone is going to go home from the luncheon with these fabulous fragrances in their bag so they can really smell them and decide who they're going to vote for. It's a first in Fragrance Foundation history, and you'll be doing that right after the luncheon, hopefully on April 6th. And the race is on. So the polls opened on March 14th for your favorite uh, fragrance to vote for, the Consumer Choice Awards, which is for men's and women's. So to make this simple, I just want to explain to everyone, because I didn't really know. Everyone who's a member of the Fragrance Foundation has a vote depending on a retailer, size of your business, or whatever. But we also have a Consumer Choice Award. So that means the entire American population can vote, and it started already. So it started on March 14, and it continues to the end of May. And we're excited about that as well. So the polls close on uh, Memorial Day. OK, next event. If you don't have this on your calendar, please put it on. On June 12, the Fragrance Foundation Awards are going to take place again. We're going to present Olivier Cresp of Ferminish, the Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, and there are going to be a lot of other big awards there, too. So you've heard enough from me. There's a lot to be heard today. So I want to also express a huge thank you to Givadon, who is our generous event sponsor of the creatives today. Thank you, Givadon. And another great lady gets to come up to the podium. It's all about women today. I'm so excited. So please welcome uh, Givadon's head of fine fragrance for all of North America, Ms. Emily Bond. Thanks, Linda. Um, so we just wanted to say that Givadon is super proud to be sponsoring the creatives for 2018. And as I can see from this room, this is clearly the must attend event for the fragrance industry. And the panel that you have here today of women, which I like to call the fierce females, I hope you women don't mind, but as Linda said, and we're very proud, um, they all contribute in their own incredible creative way to the total creation of fragrance. And we know that the consumers like it, as witnessed by the success of these beautiful products, but also they inspire and they delight all of us. And Jane is coming up, so talk about creative. As Linda already mentioned, um, Jane has all, nearly a 30-year career in journalism, and she's known for her sharp and humorous wit, um, most recently as the executive beauty editor of W, and now a contributor for Elle Decor, as well as penning the column, The Beauty of It All, in the cut for New York Magazine, and you heard of Coveture. But I'd like you please to check out The Fraudulent Chef to see her hits, her misses in the kitchen. And if you don't follow her Instagram, it is a riot. I love your dog and your style. So without further ado, the tour de force creative, Jane Lockworthy. How about now? Oh, there we go. Um, what, you went off the book. That was good. You didn't even follow your, you, she had her script there and she did it without, there we go, wow, you can really hear me now. Um, I was going to bring my dog Remy, but um, she doesn't like wearing fragrance very much, so, uh, and then, or she has too many of them and, and for her to decide which one she wants to wear, then it gets really political. And I told her, that room, this room, don't be political. Um, thanks for being here, everybody, uh, and thanks for saying how funny I am, so I'm going to not make one joke, <laughs> because the pressure is just too much. So um, I don't like sitting up here by myself, so I'm going to introduce my panel, and here we go. The first up is Erin Lauder, founder, yes, <laughs> applaud, please. Founder and creative director of Erin Style and Erin and Style Image Director Estee Lauder, designer, tastemaker, working mother of two. Erin is a modern day style icon. Committed to living life more beautifully, she founded the luxury lifestyle brand Erin in 2012. With a love for interiors and a talent for creating warm, inviting spaces, Erin's elegant, effortless aesthetic is a re reflection of her unique upbringing. As she says. Beauty is my heritage, but home is my passion. I love that quote. 
There was an opportunity in the market for a lifestyle brand based on feminine, modern, and effortless products with a strong heritage. I decided to launch Erin and make the whole concept of beauty part of the way we live today. Erin began her career at Estee Lauder in 1992, holding various executive roles throughout her time there. In the short time since its launch, Erin has emerged as a distinct voice in the world of beauty, fashion, and home decor. Erin Beauty includes 20, count them, you saw them out there, fragrances featuring the best-selling Amber Musk, Mediterranean Honeysuckle, and Rose de Grasse. Erin, please get up here and join me. And as you will see, it's soup day. Okay, I can't do that big step, sorry. Oh, it's a <laughs> Very little, impressed. Uh, <laughs> I think they want you here. here. Okay, next to me. Next up is, sorry, where is it? Karen Curry. Oh, I lost a page. Karen. Karen is a senior advisor, creative and strategic development, corporate fragrance for the Estee Lauder Companies, Inc. Known for her creative energy, passion, and innate ability to understand how women connect with fragrance, Karen has led the development of how some of the world's most enduring scents, including Estee Lauder Beautiful, Tom Ford Black Orchid, Calyx by Prescriptives, and DKNY Be Delicious. After developing her nose at Norda, which eventually became a part of Givadon, Karen joined the Estee Lauder companies in 1981. She worked with Mrs. Estee Lauder on the creation of Beautiful and with Evelyn Lauder on Pleasures. And since its launch in 2007, she has worked with Tom Ford on the Tom Ford private blends and signature fragrances. Most recently, Karen worked with Erin on the development of her fragrance collection. She received the Living Legend Award from the American Society of Perfumers in 2007 and was honored at the 2012 Visionaires Gala Award Ceremony by the Museum of Modern Arts and Design in New York as one of the most influential and indelible fragrance developers. And I, for one, am in complete denial that you are retiring. So get up here and we'll never let you leave. It's very awkward. It's awkward. And finally, Honorine Blanc. This master perfumer combines undeniable personal strength with a true artistic spirit. After graduating from, I should have asked this, Isipka? Yeah. Thank you. In 1993, Honorine joined IFF in New York. She began her firm niche career in 2005 and was elevated to master perfumer in 2013, a title earned from major market successes and demonstrated leadership within the fine fragrance world. An admitted perfectionist, Honorine wants to create fragrances that are themselves imperfect and addictive, filled with new ideas, tensions, and emotions. Creating, sorry, collaborating, collaborating closely with Erin and Karen, she created many Erin collection bestsellers, including Amber Musk and Mediterranean Honeysuckle. Kareen, would you please join us? Let's start this. We really should have rehearsed the walk up behind the podium yeah. around the chairs thing. Um, all right, so Erin, why did you decide to start your own company? Well, after about 20 years in the beauty industry, I had this dream, and I remember I was conceptualizing the idea, and I showed it to my cousin, and he said, that's kind of like a color story on steroids. And I think that's probably a great way to describe it, because I loved beauty. Beauty's in my heritage, sure. it's my blood, but I've always had this passion for home. And about seven years ago, I had this idea of creating a beauty lifestyle collection. Mm -hmm. And I remember I went to Fabrizio, and if people in the audience know Fabrizio, he's like, I love the idea, but you have to focus group it, write a business plan, and present it to the board. So easier said than done, but it was exciting because it did give me the green light to go into all my other categories yeah, that I yeah. love so much. So um, in 2012, we launched Beauty. And a few months later, we came out with a collection of home objects at Bergdorf's. And since then, we've gone into many markets and many categories. Did your mother's, sorry, did your grandmother's taste and what she did for a living influence your own passion for fragrances, and particular the ones that you love? Well, she definitely influenced me almost more than just the fragrances. Sure. I mean, obviously, she loved fragrance. And when we launched our fragrances, Karen and I, we launched multiples at once. And some people said, why are you doing that? And we had this concept of a wardrobe of fragrances. Mm -hmm. And Esty had this wonderful quote that you wouldn't wear the same dress to have dinner and as you would to play tennis, why would you wear the same fragrance? And we thought that felt so modern and so relevant because our fragrances are about experience, discovery, exploration, and fantasy. And you know, it's interesting when I think about Esty and what I've learned from her, so many different things, but 
she was really the first beauty lifestyle kind of role model for mm. me. I remember seeing her makeup table covered with a vase of flowers, beautiful makeup brushes, a makeup bag, all her product samples, and I think that just became the norm for me. So when I think about the objects that you see when you came in today, all the flowers and vases, it is very much inspired by her. So she taught me so much more than just beauty. When you were growing up, did you have a wardrobe of fragrances yourself? Did you live by that credo? I kind of did. I think my father, who's in the audience, used to always bring home samples and testers, and Jane and I always laughed that we thought it was the norm to have a lipstick tester in our bathroom. <laughs> so we did grow up, and you know, Karen and I always, I think I met when I was really little with Karen in Palm Beach with Tom Joy, is it Tom Joy? Tom Joy, when I was quite young. And I remember Esty always had samples in front of her. So it was definitely, I have to say, Mrs. Lauder, Mrs. Estee Lauder always used Erin from a very young age as a fragrance tester and a sounding board. And I remember working for months on submissions, thinking I'm this close, and then all of a sudden I said, well, Erin says, and she was 14, and I said, oh, okay. Well, this, was, this was from the very beginning. The 14-year-old girls definitely have opinions. Thank yeah, God I don't have a 14-year-old girl. A 14-year-old didn't like the fragrance, but okay. Oh, sorry. It prepared me for what came later. That was okay. I can only imagine the vocabulary that you use too, where you're like, this is nice. No, but I was, I've always loved fragrance. This you know, like my cookies. People always ask what's my earliest memory, and I think it is getting in the car with my grandmother in a confined space, and she was working on beautiful forever, mm. and just smelling the roses and her scent, and mm -hmm. I think my earliest memory of her is really how she smelled, and I think fragrance is so interesting. It can change your mood, it can make you happy, and we always talk about what fragrance notes I don't like, and you try to sneak them in, and I always find them, <laughs> so. The perfumers make me. I know, sorry. They do. They do. Okay. I do it for them. Well, I have to ask, what are the notes you don't like? Well, I don't love woody, like, nutty notes, and I, I definitely, I don't know if it's because my children are allergic to nuts, so I don't love nuts, but there's something. Like a visceral reaction. <laughs> well, I just always find it. I always think it smells yeah. too earthy. She finds it at, like, parts per million. Parts per million, and, and when you're sensitive to something, you're sensitive to it. You know, I'm sure that the perfumers here could probably write the book on the notes we don't use or the notes I don't like, um, you know, dry woody notes or grape notes and methyl and phenylate, not my favorite notes. So we, we work it out between the two of us. Well, I was just gonna say, I mean, personally you might not like woody notes, but obviously when you're thinking about your customer, you have to step out. I mean, obviously, the, it is your name on the brand, mm -hmm. so it's what you want to present, but you obviously have to think about what she is going to like. And, and we then, definitely incorporate them. I mean, it's not all about florals, and I've learned from the best, and I've been very much informed that it's not just about one specific type, and we do have a wardrobe, and we yeah. do have the woody, and the ambers, and the woods, and I mean, I've had so many wonderful experiences working, but you know, when you take a fragrance that's completely woody and nutty, it might yeah. not be on my top of my yeah. list. That's why you need the partnership, and it's why when we talked about this panel, Aaron and I both very much wanted to be with us, because the story wouldn't be complete if we didn't have a perfumer with us, yeah. and particularly this perfumer, um, who knows how to get us to where we need to be, even with quote unquote notes that we don't particularly like. That's what it's There's all about. There's always a way to use them. Well, that, that does lead me to my next question, which is can you guys walk me through the process of, of, you know, of creating the, the, the fragrances? Like, what is, Karen, what is the working process with Erin like? And then, Honorine, feel free to chime in too. Say only good things because yes. she's sitting right here. <laughs> I, know, I know, she's right next to me. Um, it's actually, I have to say... Is it different, in other words? Like, yeah, it is. How, how, how it is, is it individually? Because it's incredibly collaborative, and it is very, very, very much driven by what's in Erin's mind. So, for example, for the collection part of the Erin the Beauty business, it always starts with a mood board that Erin curates herself. So the mood board is visuals, sometimes it's textures, sometimes it's materials, mm -hmm. and she picks them herself. So it takes the perfumers and I beyond semantics, mm -hmm. beyond fragrance references, and it's based on emotion, and it's based on um, what she's thinking. It's a way to express it, and that's how we start. In the case of the, what we call the premier collection, which is Rose de Grasse and the two rose fragrances, it's about a particular iconic ingredient or iconic category that she loves. We dive into that and find a way to reinvent it and do it in a very uber luxe, distinctly Erin way. So they're very different, but she's at Furmanish with me, as the team can attest. Often, you know, they get the call, we're coming. And, and, and in she walks. 
and we do modifications together. Um, so it's extremely <coughs> collaborative and it's very personal. This is not someone who approves something at the end. <laughs> When you, so does the mood board then stay at Fermanish? So Does no. it get translated into a brief at some point? Yes, for example, my approach for both uh, collection and premiere are a bit different. As Karen said, for the premiere, it's all about this unique ingredient. So generally, we try to create uh, an exclusive ingredient for Erin. Uh, for example, if um, we talk about the tubereuse Le Jour that I created with Olivier Cresp, we uh, used the tubereuse uh, India, absolute, mm -hmm. and we created a nature print of uh, tubereuse very early in the morning, so we get the flower as soon as it's open. And the approach of that tubereuse was very unique because normally tubereuse are uh, narcotic, dark, and here we wanted to have a tubereuse that's a bit more fragile, delicate. And we add sleek woods, even if I know you don't like too much, but we find a way. <laughs> it's all about negotiation. <laughs> to put it, because it's very important for modern structure. For the collection, it's different. For the collection, it's more about textures and emotions, because I believe we can give textures to every fragrance. So there are two fragrances that we worked on that we all love. Is, um, the first one is uh, Material and Honeysuckle. Mm -hmm. And for that one, the, the whole idea was the Mediterranean. So uh, I really wanted to create the emotion of calm, but yet sparkling. So we use uh, the citrus that you love, the mandarin, the grapefruit. And the texture here was more about the dewy honeysuckle. Uh, so it, you know, we really worked with this honeysuckle with Karen that you know, we, we had for many years. And then to give it more richness, because the richness is very important in fragrances, we add jasmine sambac. The other fragrance that it's one of my favorite is Amber Musk. Uh, here, and this is what I love about this brand, is every fragrance is unique. You can, uh, every time I start from a white page, mm -hmm. is, I don't get inspired from another fragrance from Erin. Everything is unique. Right. And right. this is why I, I, I love that. And here, we use two molecules. So we use synthetic, but they're very expensive molecule. One is a mucinone, which is a captive mask, and the other one is Ambrox that we combine with one of Erin's favorite flowers, uh, Rose Antifolia. And this is how we end up by having a fragrance that's fluid, modern, and effortless. It's not heavy, it's very chic. And uh, we use, ev every time we use a new structure. It's never the same. In some brand you see a correlation. Sure. Which I love here every time I have fun, yeah. discovering new materials, discovering new structure, with different mood board. Totally clean slate each time. That is unique. I think we need to step back a little. I realize we, um, just to explain to the audience, would one of you like to, to um, differentiate the uh, premiere and collection and how they are different from each other? <laughs> well, I mean, we don't use the phrases in a consumer facing okay. way, but we kind of use it as our way of organizing and defining the fragrance portfolio. So, collection is a group of 10 fragrances that is based, based, it's based and inspired by Erin's experiences, her travel. Every time she takes a trip, I know there's a new project coming. Um, it's all about the experiences in her life and it's about expressing moods, emotions, experiences. Okay, so it can be anything from a fabulous musk to a citrus floral to whatever is in her mind at the time. Premiere, is a parfum collection, whereas collection is eau de parfums. Premier is a parfum collection, which really is kind of Erin's ode to the artisanal nature of fragrance creation. Mm -hmm. It's about the ingredients that she loves the most, which is why Rose de Grasse was the first one. Um, and it's finding a very special, very unique way to do it. So for example, in Rose de Grasse, one rose wasn't enough. There's a rose fusion accord that is three of the most expensive roses because she can. Mm -hmm. right. Right. Um, so right. it, that's, we needed a defined personality and persona so that we knew how we were gonna build this business going forward. And we did this, we talked about this from the very beginning. Before we launched the first fragrances, we knew how we were gonna build the business and how we were gonna approach to adding on to it. So if, if, um the scents are based on your trips. 
Well, I'm totally going to make a joke right now. <laughs> now <laughs> you have this uh -oh. look on your face, you know. So now that Jack is going to college, will there be like something called like Wharton Campus? <laughs> <laughs> Wharton I Quad. Not. I hope not. Um, no, I mean, it's funny. It is about trips. You can smell it. it you can smell it, nice. yes, exactly. Notes beer, beer, beer. But I think... <laughs> beer. <laughs> Keg. But, no, but I, you know, it's about trips and fantasy. And, you know, I think what's so inspiring is that even if you're not in Capri, you can still look at the pictures and be inspired and be intrigued by a beautiful place. And I think that's what's the, the power of the digital phenomena. And I think with our fragrances, as Karen said, collection is really about discovery, escape, and experiencing something different. And we did, you know, Amber Musk was very much inspired by Colorado, Mediterranean. She said it's the Mediterranean and Tangier Vigny from Tangier. So it's places that I've been to and places that I've dreamed about. I've actually never been to India, and I'm dying to go, and I'm going to go this fall. And we were, oh, it was so fun, because even though I haven't been, after experiencing this fragrance and working on it, and I was actually at an event on Saturday, and a woman came up to me from India who loves our fragrances, and she says it smells exactly the way they smell. And I felt, you know what? Job well done. We did it. And um, so, and you know, and as Karen said, you know, for Premier, it is about, it's a different price point. It has a different point of view. It is a perfume, mm -hmm. and um, I think that's what makes it fun for the consumer to discover. Yeah, absolutely. Karen, is working with Erin, are there any similarities to what it was like to work with Mrs. Lauder? Oh, yes. Runs in the family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, Erin is obviously very much her person and she, her own person, and she has a very modern sense of style. But there are moments that I look at her and say, oh, my Lord, I'm just channeling really? your grandmother. Really? I hope it's a good thing. It's a good thing. So, <laughs> yes. no, for example, we just talked about the fact that many of our fragrances come from Erin's life and her experiences, and she uses everything that comes into her life to fuel her creativity. Estee did that. All of you, or many of you, have heard the stories of Mrs. Lauder testing her fragrances when she was working on them on everyone from Friends in Palm Beach to New York taxi drivers. You want to know how many comments I've gotten? Because when the boys were at school and one of the mothers smelled the fragrance on Erin, we have to change this, or now the boys' friends. It's all about drawing this input from real people. But I think that you know, the most some of the most interesting things is that Mrs. Lauder was a perfectionist. Every aspect of every product we did had to be perfect. Hmm. Apple it's doesn't fall far. Okay. It's the same. Every, every little detail is important. Um, and the, the, you can tell the story about the lilac pass. Well, that's so what, good. That's where, you you're know, lucky Estee did not have um, cell phone email. or email. Yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Mrs. Lauder would often call me um, with feedback on projects. She'd call on Thanksgiving. She'd call on Christmas. Erin doesn't call me on holidays. But Sunday night emails became a ritual. And one Sunday night, I got this email that began, and I kid you not because I still have the email, please don't kill me. <laughs> so I knew the rest of this was not going to be something I wanted to hear. We were within months of launching a fragrance, and Harry will remember this story, and it just wasn't feeling right. It just didn't feel right. And you know, isn't that part of a, founding, a founder and a new company? I can't tell you what's wrong. It's not right. And I'm in the Hamptons, and Estee's beautiful lilac bush, which Mrs. Lauder had planted at the house that Erin inherited, was in bloom. She said, could we ever do a lilac? And I said, you know, nobody's done a lilac in a while. It could be a little old-fashioned, but let's think about it. Started sending the emails, and Harry and Richard created with Erin a beautiful lilac called Lilac Path that's one of our top-selling fragrances. So it's all about responding to instinct and being able to go with the flow when the idea hits. I feel like emails that begin with please don't kill me <laughs> <laughs> it's true. usually end with a justified result. Like, it's, it is a sign of perfectionism, but you knew, you trusted your guy. And when she was telling the story, you tensed. Because you, you had this memory of like, oh God, I remember what it felt like to send her that. But you knew. Yeah. So, you know, God on ya. Um, Honorine, you have created three quarters of Erin's fragrances. What do you think it is about your relationship together that works so well? And do you remember the first time you met and can you describe it? Yes, uh, I met Erin for the first time in 2007. We worked together with Karen and Amber Elang, remember? Um, it was not easy at the beginning because it was my first approach and I really wanted to work because for me, 
She represents the American market, right. and me being French coming here, I really wanted to succeed here in the United States. And then the more I get to know her, well, I'm a perfectionist too, so I know what it is. Sometimes it's not easy, but when you get to the end result, you're very satisfied. Uh, but I learned something about Erin um, is, yes, there are notes she likes, she, other notes that she doesn't like, but for me, there are three codes that are very important that we see in every of her fragrances. The first one's all about femininity. There is no ambiguity in her life. It's all about femininity. You have some line you see that unisex here, it has to be ultra feminine, and I love that because we talk about sensuality, we talk about beauty. The second one is sophistication. Sometimes I feel that some fragrances lack of sophistication, mm. and here it's very important, and it goes with the structure of the fragrance. And the third is quality which I'm very lucky because when you have quality, you have a bigger palette of raw materials you can play with, so you're much more creative. But these three has to be put together in a package that's very modern. And the structure, even if they're complex, the end result has to seem very simple, so it's effortless, and I think belong more to the modern world. The next question I have is, um, it sounds very me too, and it really isn't, not me too, but the whole women's movement, but you work with mostly women, and we are, you are three women who work together. Is there uh, an ease to it? Is, is there a sort of language that you find that when you work together, not that men wouldn't understand, but I guess I am actually saying that. Like, can you, do you agree with me on this, on this sentiment of, of what it is like to have women working with women? Well, I, I think it's so exciting and so rewarding to work with women. My, yeah. my first mentor was Jane Huddis, and I worked with her um, when I was in, I think I was in college in the summer, and I walked into her office, and it was such like that New York City moment. She had her iced coffee, her Armani pants suit, her Donna Karen bodysuit, and she like file of facts. And I was like, I want to be her when I grow up. I really, it was so like New York working perfection. And she taught me so much. I used to come into the office at 8 o'clock, and there'd be like a note on my door, like, please see me. And it was like, and she put a time. It was like 7.45. I was like, OK. But you know, I think there's something amazing working with women and men. But I do think there's something fascinating in a, in a, in a whatever, business where you produce product for women, because I think women know what women want. And I think when you say you design a makeup bag or a hairbrush or a fragrance, the women are actually wearing it and trying it and enjoying it. And I think there's something very intimate and very connected about that. But I've worked with amazing men. I mean, obviously my father, my uncle, my cousin have been a huge part of my career. So I love working with men and women, but I think with, in the sense of floral mm. fragrance and right, elements sure. that pertain to a woman's life, I think there's something really interesting about that. And fragrance is, should not be gender free, but often. I do like I very mean, feminine. And it's not very ironic that I have two boys who are mm. such right. boys. But I think everyone needs a touch of feminine. Do your boys life. have favorite fragrances? Of yours? <laughs> um, no, but it's a great story because I was working on private collection years and years and years ago. And I guess I was wearing it constantly and I would send my son off to kindergarten and I would give him a big hug and I would send him into the room to be at school. And um, his teacher said, I need to talk to you about something. I said, oh God, he's the second, he's quite tough. I hope he didn't like hurt someone or hit someone or do something. <laughs> and we sat down and she said, he smells so good every oh day. <laughs> what is it? And I, was, I couldn't tell him. And I kind of have just started telling him the story. But now he's 17 and he's quite confident. So I don't think he cared that he smelled like private collection tuberose gardenia. <laughs> but I did give her the bottle when we launched it. And she's like, that is exactly what Will's Hoffer smelled like. So it is, you know, I think they're really proud of what I do. And yeah. I think they understand it. But I don't think they're running to wear Amber Musk. <laughs> But they do love it. Well, that's like SG's famous line, you know, tell a friend, telegraph, tell a woman. Exactly. Absolutely. So there you go. Um, all right. So, Erin, more than ever, actually, this is for all of you, more than ever, fragrance has become part of our lifestyle. It's not just this separate thing that's on our vanity. Um, and for the Erin brand, it's obviously a lifestyle brand. How do you seamlessly weave the elements of each of your pillars, and I mean not just the two fragrance ones, but all of them within each other? Is there like an overriding um, filter, for lack of a better well, word? When or we design the package, um, we definitely line them all up. We sit in a conference right. room and we put all the fragrances together to make sure they work as a cohesive story mm -hmm. and don't cannibalize each other and don't you know, conflict with each mm -hmm. other. So it's definitely a collection that we always look at. And in the sense of home, 
I said when we go to the Mediterranean for fragrance, we're also going to the Mediterranean for home and accessories. Mm -hmm. So all the colors work together. When you walk into our lifestyle stores, um, and we're about to open up one in East Hampton this May, you do see that whole consistency, and I think that's really important. I think I've learned that from working at Estee Lauder companies for so many years, the consistency and the, the power of a strong image. And is it the same thing with, say, like Williams Sonoma? It is, yes. We've just, we're about to launch our next spring, and that was, has been an amazing opportunity. It was really, when I got the phone call to do it, I was so honored and so excited, and it's a 60-year brand, and they've never done a collaboration before with anyone who's not a chef. I'm not the best cook, so it was such an <laughs> honor. But what was interesting was it was very similar to working with Estee Lauder. It was all about storytelling, an incredible heritage, beautiful quality, amazing products. And our first collection was blue and white. Mm -hmm. And it was quite seamless. And we're just coming out with our second one this spring. And like what Honoré was saying, did they give you a blank slate? or? Well, it was, it was interesting, yes and no. I mean, they knew what they wanted, and they definitely had colors they wanted to work with. And we did concept boards exactly the way we do with fragrance. We kind of created a concept inspired by Palm Beach. Um, we were opening up a store in Palm Beach, and we were having hibiscus palm as our fragrance, so we were all kind of connected. Um, but yes, working with them has been an amazing experience. But they're very, they're very specific as to what they want and what they want to launch, so we work very much in a, as a partnership. Very cool. Speaking of specific, what smells do each of you absolutely hate? Well, and I know woods, I'm not, and I don't mean <laughs> fragrance necessarily, but like I like to ask this question because like my favorite smell in the world is probably gasoline. My worst is, I'm not gonna say. But is, are there smells that you hate? For me, the word hate is a bit difficult. Um, yes, there are materials that I dislike, but I've learned with time to use them because I believe when you don't like something and you work with that product, you're much more creative because you get oh, right. out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And I love that. And so, yes, there are notes. I remember I used to have problems with lavender. And with time, I decided, OK, this is going to be my next challenge to take lavender. Or I play a game with Karen and Erin. And I know they don't like this element. I know she has a book, Karen, that there is an element you cannot choose. But with time, you know, it's the way you put them together. Mm -hmm. Sure. And, um, and you, you learn how to like them. But if I have to say the word, you know, hate, it would be the smell of fear. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's, oh good. that's a good one. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Do you hate fear too? <coughs> Me? I mean, I, yes. I mean, I, of course, everyone hates fear, but that's interesting. Mm -hmm. I actually don't like gasoline. That's so funny that you like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I like a new car. And, I don't know. I love the smell of new car. That's so funny. <laughs> okay. Karen? That's, that's yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. I, you know, there, are, there are some, not a lot, actually, but there are some that I really, really don't like, and many perfumers, and I have a tug of war, Harry, right, over when trying to sneak them in, and when they show up in a fragrance, as I said, things like methyl anthranolate, which is this kind of, to me, it smells like bad 80s fragrances or grape juice. Um, but it works in a lot of fragrances, so if we can put it in and I don't have to smell it in my face, right. it's an okay thing. But there aren't so many that I don't like. The ones I don't like, I really don't <laughs> like. I don't think there's so many. Obviously, she does, but um, <laughs> it's okay. Do you, have a, do you have a favorite smell in the whole wide world? And don't say your son's skin. I feel like I asked you that years ago, and that's what you said. Really? A lot of a lot of young moms say that, and I totally get that. But okay, well, I'll what's say your roses. favorite smell? I now? actually love roses, and okay. it was that's why one of the reasons when we created the rose collection, it was just like that beautiful fresh mm. rose. And mm -hmm. I don't know if it's because I've always grown up. You know, my grandmother always had roses. She loved Bulgarian rose; was her favorite scent. I think that was such a part of who she was. Um, tuberose was always in her front hallway. Mm. I love the smell of tuberose and rose, so that is my favorite sound. Yeah. Anna Ring, what's yours? Oh, my favorite? Mm. <laughs> I would say there's a, we have a molecule called Umbrox. Mm. It's a modern amber, and I'm addicted to it. I love the Umbrox. Nice. Yeah. Karen, did you answer? I, you know, I have to Karen, say. Karen, you have to answer. I'm a, I'm a little promiscuous in notes that I love, because there's a lot of things Promiscuous with notes. Oh, you There's a lot of woman. notes I love, everything from florals to ambers to whatever, but if I had to pick one, it would probably be peony, because I love the flower, and some of you know this, we were working on pleasures with Annie Byzantium when I was doing, when I met my husband. 
And oh, so that kind of has a very special, so I guess if I had to pick one, it would probably be three. Okay, sweet. Um, I want to ask about trends. Do trends, I'm, I think I know the answer already. How do trends factor in the creation of your product or do you just always go with your gut? And I think, I want you to answer it, but the rest of you, if you have thoughts on it too. Yeah, me. Yeah, well I think trends are a very important part of the fragrance process. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you look at the runway trends, you're seeing the return of florals for right. this fall. Um, I think there's a ton of that and I think that you know it's exciting when you see that you're consistent. And also, I also think color. I mean, a, fragrance oh, yeah. has a lot to do with color. You know, that idea of whether it's a brown cap or a lavender cap or, you know, Evening Rose was a really interesting mm -hmm. collaboration that we did. I think the trends are a huge part of it because I always feel that what you're seeing on the runway, you want to incorporate into fashion, into beauty, and in, even into home. So I think trends are, I mean, I think you go with intuition because you kind of feel what you like, whether it's lilac or amber, but I do think trends are a huge part of it. I also think political, sorry to interrupt, I know I'm, not, I'm asking, not answering, but political climate. Like, I've spoken to so many people recently who's like, we all want to feel comforted, we all want to cocoon, we all want to, you know, just kind of escape a little. So, anyway, honoring. Honoring. Oh, uh, you know what I believe about trends. Um, the, it's different in perfumery because when we start working on the fragrance, by the time it's on the market, it's in two years. Oh, right. Uh, so, um, I, Personally, I don't like trends. <laughs> uh, I believe that uh, we have to be first creative. And I always say, it's the fragrance that's create the trends and not the trends that create the fragrance. Right. So uh, as a perfumer, I think my role is really to create trends and not to follow them. Okay. And that's probably interesting from a fragrance point of view versus packaging, mm -hmm. because you do start working on the fragrance way before you do the package. I mean, you start thinking of the color and the mood mm -hmm and then you finesse the package, but that's very true. You do leave the trend, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. But does the packaging often um, reflect what the mood board was? Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, it all kind of works together. Mm -hmm. I mean, you say it's gonna be a very blue, sunshine fragrance, and then from there you start working on the juice, mm -hmm. and then you finesse the package. And has the juice ever, ever tweaked the packaging? Yes. Like, oh, that's a little yeah, more green. Yeah, I mean, it's all very it's connected. It's, right. like one, it's like a dance. It's a whole dance, and everything has to be synchronized. But you have to be able, you have to be flex. you have to have a vision to start, but then you have to be flexible enough to follow the road where it leads you, and that's one thing I love about working on this brand. We have a very clear vision when we start, because otherwise you kind of run around in circles, mm -hmm. but if something comes up that's a bit different than what we thought in the beginning, we go with it. Mm -hmm. And you need to be able to do that, because I think that some of the best fragrances, some of the best things in, in, that brands come about are great accidents, and you have to be willing to embrace that. And that's what I love. Erin will look at something and say, not where I thought we were going, but it's fabulous. Let's do it. And that's where intuition comes into play in a very important way. Which is a lot better than, please don't kill me. <laughs> she still says that. Yeah. Okay, it wasn't that one time. I just want you oh, to know I'm that sure. was a one time thing. Okay, that's... Uh, I am not... Not surprised at all. Um, ladies, all of you are world travelers. Where would each of you live if you did not live here today? You want to go first or you want to go last? I, I love okay. London. And okay. I always love London. And just recently I went to the countryside with a good friend and was so inspired. And I think there's something just really magical. London. Could you end up there? I probably could. I mean, I don't think I would love the rain every single day. I'm such a sunshine person. Right. As you can tell from the fragrances, there's usually flowers and sunshine and beach inspiration. But I do think it's an amazing, amazing well, city. What was it about it that, that you loved? Just the beauty of the countryside? Oh, well, I, I mean, I had gone smells, as a little probably. girl, but I had never gone as a grown-up. And it was just seeing the homes and the gardens, and there, it's like this wonderful sense of like, effortless luxury that mm -hmm. I was so intrigued by. And uh, we went to Chatsworth and saw that amazing exhibition that Hamish had worked on. Um, I just thought it was absolutely beautiful. Yeah, this is gorgeous. Karen? Um, actually, and Erin and, and I talked about this yesterday when we were kind of talking about how we wanted to answer certain questions, and we decided to do it anyway. It's London for me, too. You know? oh, yeah, said, yeah, oh, should, yeah. I, should I pick something else? <laughs> um, but as some of you know, I've spent a lot of time in London over the last few years, and really, fallen in love with the city. I love the energy, I love the vibe of it, and I love the kind of balance of history and heritage with an amazing modernity. I, I, I could see myself very easily living in London. I'd have to leave my husband here, 
because he's not such a world traveler, but um, I could see myself living in London very easily. Anyway. London for you too? No. <laughs> Uh, I different. hate London. <laughs> no, no, I love London, but um, I think I would live on the sailboat. Uh, Could be where? I'm sorry? On the sailboat. Oh, oh. Uh, I am a big introvert, and I like not to be attached to any place, and I like to be able to escape quickly. <laughs> so, um, and on sailboat, you're by yourself, mm. <laughs> and uh, I love the freedom on the sailboat. So, that's amazing. It's a dream. Yeah. That, oh, sorry, I thought someone said something. Um, okay, we're actually at our last question. So let's draw it out. This is, a, this is a very HR peer review question, but if you are willing to share, what do each of you think you could do on improving your work? Honoré, I'll start with you. Okay, there are two things that are important. The first time is time. I'm not talking on this um, brand in particular, but I think today, we don't take enough time to create fragrances, and this put a lot of pressure on all the perfumers. And uh, fragrance evolve. Um, we need more than one day, and sometimes we do too many mods. And uh, a fragrance is like a human being, it changes, and sometimes there's a hole in the structure, you don't see it right away. So first is time, and I wish we had more time. And we lived more with the fragrance, and I learned with Karen after 20 minutes, after half an hour, and I do the same thing now. Unfortunately, I have all my blotters in my dining room. My husband accept that, and I follow the fragrance. And this is very important. And the second, I, I would say creativity. I think today, um, for me, it's very important to create new territories, to start from a white page. And I feel today um, there, we're not enough creative. There's so many things we can do. There's so many new structure. I think sometimes we follow too much what the consumer want instead of surprising the consumer. I'm going to be honest, I think there is too many copies on the market, and we yes. always go in the same olfactive territories. Um, I love what I do. I love the creative process. We have such a fabulous work. Um, we should enjoy it a bit more and be creative. I think in it, 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 then you must be pleased at seeing like there are so many you know indie niche brands coming out there that are trying to push the envelope and do think outside the box. But you know I think sometimes it's too it's too easy to say because I work on a niche brand I'm creative. I think we should be creative on every project. Good point. For me it's about the formula. It's about the structure. It's not just about the brand. It's you. Ha I uh, I try to give my best on every fragrance I work on. First, it's very important for me. I, I'm a perfectionist, um, I, I'm curious, I love to play, and um, it's, I, I think we should do it on every brand, mm -hmm. not just on niche. Mm -hmm. And I think it's about brands and, and people who run brands taking leaps of faith. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Erin mentioned Jane Huddis, who's sitting here. We've worked together for many, many years on Estee Lauder, and there have been a, more than one launch where she's backed me on things that maybe weren't the obvious choice. And trust me when I tell you, a major Estee Lauder launch is not something that you play games with. Um, and she has said, we're gonna go for it. Similarly, just yesterday, Erin and I were having a conversation about a project, and she turned to me and she said, I trust you. You gotta have, you gotta be able to take that leap of faith so the perfumers can do what they do, the developers can do what we do, and together, it can be that much better. And I don't know that that happens as often, um, so we all want to go work for Jane, that's okay. But I don't know that that happens as often as it should, and I think that that is a little sad. But you didn't answer what you could do better. <laughs> but I you were hoping, I was hoping you wouldn't notice that. <laughs> um, I guess, you know, there's, a, there's quite a few people here who either work from, with me or have worked with me, um, and so I know it won't come as a surprise if I say that I know I can be extremely intense when I'm in the throes of a project, um, because it just, it matters yeah. so very much. So I think maybe the one thing I would do is to try and get myself to step back mm. just a little bit more. You know, I was working on a project the other day, and I'd been wearing mod after mod of this fragrance for a long time. You almost can't see the forest for the shirts. Sure. And so I took one I thought I liked, and it was men's fragrance, so I said to my husband, would you wear this? And all of a sudden, I started seeing different parts of it. I said, all right, you need to get over yourself and kind of step back and look at it from a different dimension. So I mm -hmm. guess maybe I'd try and 
think about doing that a little more often. Erin? And for me, I could say probably my strength and my weakness is my, is my focus. I mean, I love being inspired mm -hmm. by so many different places and things and people. And sometimes I have so many ideas right. that it's important for me to hone in on one. Hone in on one. Right. Okay. But then I put them on the side and make my list and refer back to them. It's hard. It definitely is hard. All right, guys, we are done. Thank you all so much for being part of this. You are so special in all of your industries, and uh, we really appreciate you doing this for us. So thank, thank, thank you. you. For thank you. Thank you. I think we had lived that, but Aaron, I, I believe I met you, I was telling you yesterday, when you just came out of college and joined the Estee Lauder companies and was going to probably start working for Jane. Wow, you have come a long way. I could almost feel it. So I think it's great that we ended with that because it's sort of what happened. I love that story about the scotch and your grandfather. But ladies, <laughs> you have inspired us today. You have added so much value because, you know, we all see everything from a distance, but to see you up close and personal really makes a huge difference. Honorine, that perfectionist thing, I love it about you. Can you imagine what the three of them are like together when they're working on this? And Karen, you've really brought the whole thing together. And Aaron, you have a lifestyle brand that uh, everyone here is now assigned to go out and get into that shop because when you see it, you're gonna want absolutely everything. But it, it just exudes everything about your style and it's magnificent. So everyone knows I always get like very choked up at the end of these conversations, <laughs> but it's so good. So we're so happy that everyone came today. Did everyone have a fantastic time listening to this panel?